part of the way that God works with me as a witness is slightly different from the way that he worked with the prophets of old. The prophets of old heard a message from the Lord that pointed forward, but the way that he works with his prophets of this time is that he'll still speak a message, but it's usually calling people into repentance, which is the same as the prophets of old, and letting them know about judgment that is coming, judgment that has already been prophesied about in the Bible. The new part of that is that there are certain things within the scroll that have been sealed up. We've been told that. We've been told that in Daniel and and Revelation. But whatever God's prophets are telling you now should always go with scripture. It should always be a message that goes with scripture, that is consistent with scripture and is bringing together usually not one piece of scripture, but many pieces of scripture that God brings together. And for me personally, when he brings that together, it's like, whoa, okay, well, I had read this in Revelation and I read this in Ezekiel and this in Jeremiah and this in Isaiah, but I didn't see it going down like this. I didn't see you putting it together like this. So when I say the new piece of that is really the way that he's bringing it together and fulfilling this particular thing. The problem in counterfeit Christianity is that what they've done in order to make a name for themselves, and this is where it becomes a real problem when you're making a marketplace of God and your livelihood is based on you being some sort of biblical expert. Give me a break. There are no biblical experts. God reveals to you in season. The problem that I've seen is that people in counterfeit Christianity who have set themselves up to be leaders and teachers and so-called prophets, is that they do not sit in the council of God. That's first and foremost, because this is not about any story that we're putting together. And they try to put scripture together in their carnality as though it's a puzzle piece. And what they don't realize, because they don't sit in the council of God, is that there are some things in scripture that you just have to read over and over. You just have to become really familiar with it and have the basics down of what it is that God's saying And when he reveals in season what it is that he's revealing, he's going to use your repertoire of your familiarity with scripture in order to show you when he's revealing that. That is a totally different way of approaching scripture. The other way, the counterfeit Christian way, is I need to know exactly how this is going to go down. And so I'm going to create some fluff. I'm going to insert my own details into what God's doing. Oh, the mark of the beast is AI. It's a tattoo. It's a chip. It's the vaccine. If that's the way that you approach scripture, that you have to put your own details in there in order to have the security and the comfort of being able to supposedly control God's word, you're never going to come to truth. You will have, I mean, you will have even read the message in vain. What's the point of reading the message if the story you're going to put together is not even true? Now you've distorted God's word and made yourself guilty. God reveals his word in his time. Notice that the word never said, the word prophesied about Jesus, prophesied about the king of the Jews who was going to come and restore the kingdom to Israel. And the idea that people had about what that was going to look like was totally different. When Jesus arrived here having nothing that anyone would desire him, The Pharisees and the Sadducees, the teachers of the law who are very familiar with the word, they were like, what? No, this is not our king. You read about the image of the beast and you see that the image of the beast is, has been created by the false prophet, which I've demonstrated to you is the United States, can only be the United States. So it's this image that's been created by the United States. And that image has been given breath by the false prophet of the United States. And... And the false prophet forces everyone to worship the image and the image forces everyone to worship it and receive its mark. What in the world does that look like? Oh, it must be a statue. Must be a statue that can talk? Well, what is counterfeit Christianity worshiping right now? What is it that was created, this Frankenstein that was created by the United States, given breath so it could speak, given power to be able to persecute God's people, who refuse to worship it. And by the way, if you say anything against it, you can go to jail. No more freedom of press, no more freedom of speech. That is the image of counterfeit Israel. That thing that was established in 1948 that has nothing to do with the Israel that got established in the Bible. A nation set apart to him. Not a land, a nation 
set apart to him who are in the covenant of circumcision. I'm using these examples because these are doozies. When God showed me who the image of the Antichrist was, after having shown me who the Antichrist is, or what it, the kingdom that it represents, after having shown me who the false prophet is, after having shown me who, what the mark of the beast is, after having shown me the abomination of desolation, all of these things, by the time he showed me the image of the Antichrist, I was, I was just floored. I've read Revelation 13 a million times. I teach the book of Revelation over and over and over. We fi literally finish the book and we start right back up the next week. I'm incredibly familiar with it. And yet, I'm not an expert. What would I be an expert in? How God himself has deemed that he's going to fulfill things? Listen, you get familiar with the material. And at the right time, the Holy Spirit is going to show you what, how he's revealing it, what he's doing. That's very uncomfortable for human beings. You want to read something and you want to be able to understand it right away. You want to know what it's going to look like. And in this way, you think that you can control it and you can take the glory for yourself. And that's what counterfeit Christianity has done. What I've been trying to show you on the channel and really have just been kind of living out. I mean, it's, I don't even, when I say trying to show you, it almost sounds like I have control over it. What I have been demonstrating to you on the channel and trying to point out to you is the way in which God reveals things to me. Several months back, I was reading many books of scripture and I was saying, God is showing me this, this, and this. This is what he's putting on my heart. And so this is what I'm gonna read with you. And I would just do a video on that. All right, we're reading from Isaiah, Micah, Jeremiah, whatever. God is speaking to me, sword, famine, wild beast, and plague. We're gonna look up every context of sword, famine, wild beast, and plague. God is speaking to me about the razor of judgment. And the king of Assyria, we're going to look this up in Ezekiel. We're going to look it up in Isaiah. God is speaking to me about overflowing your hiding place. Okay, I see this is in Isaiah. Let's read the context. And he had me reading it over and over and over and over, multiple times in a day, so that I was extremely familiar with the material. Did that mean that I knew how it was going to go down? No. And he even raised certain situations in my own life in order to make it meaningful to me so that I could understand the message in a way that I would not be able to understand if he had not made it meaningful to me. Does he do that? Yeah, God does that. He raises parables, circumstances, experiences, feelings, memories, sensations. Don't you learn that in Job 33 when Elihu is responding to Job? He makes things meaningful to you. Did he tell Jeremiah, go and buy this field while Babylon is laying siege to Jerusalem and Jeremiah goes and buys the field? He made things meaningful to him. And Jeremiah turns to him and goes, hey, uh, like, what's the deal? Why are you having me buy this field? What in the, at the same time that you're telling me that Babylon is laying siege to Jerusalem. Do you think it was a little more meaningful to Jeremiah when God responded, I'm God, I can do anything. And in this land, land will again be purchased here and divided up. Do you think that that made it more meaningful to Jeremiah having purchased the land and then looking forward to what God is going to fulfill, or then if God had said, had just given him the message. It made it personal, because when you buy land, you're invested in it. And then you start thinking about, wonder what God's going to do here. What does the message mean? How does it feel to wait for this fulfillment? God had me purchase a building in 2020, and he has used that building in order to teach me how to care for his house even keeping it empty because no one would accept the message. And he was teaching me, I can keep this house empty until people are ready to actually fill it, until they're ready to actually accept the message and obey. That building was dilapidated. There were squatters there. It smelled like pot because it had been used as a dispensary. He had me restore that building. And as I was restoring it, he was helping me to understand how I would be working with his house to restore it, how to clean it up how to care for it, how to put my own resources into it, even at the point that God ha pulled me out of my career and I was no longer making money. He taught me how to put my entire life savings and my retirement into caring for that house. And I haven't made a dime on that house because at a certain point, the people who were working for me, he no longer allowed them to work for me. He drove them out and he taught me how to not use his house for my own benefit, but how to serve his house, seeking first the kingdom of God, seeking first his plan and his will and what he's doing. Do you think it made it more meaningful to me that I was putting all of my resources 
and that I continue to put all of my resources, even the little bit of energy I have to keep going over there and cleaning that house up, taking care of it, trusting that he's going to take care of things, trusting in what he said, which is to seek first the kingdom of heaven and all of my needs are going to be added to me. All of my needs will be taken care of. That's kind of an impossible message, isn't it? It's kind of impossible. So is the message to Jeremiah. That in the midst of Babylon laying siege to Jerusalem, that that land would again be divided up among his people. It's kind of an impossible thing to live through and an impossible message that you give everything that you have to me. That if you do not give everything that you have to Jesus, you cannot be his disciple. And that once having given all of that, he will take care of you. It's a little impossible. feels impossible when I'm receiving notices and emails and text messages and voicemails and et cetera, et cetera, regarding my properties being in foreclosure because that building was the one thing that would have paid for my house. But I gave that up because he told me to keep it. That's a different kind of level of faith, isn't it? And the determination of what's in your heart is whether you think I'm an idiot and crazy or you actually believe in the things he's said in his word. If you can't even hold faith for what I'm doing, how are you going to do it? How are you going to do the things that he says in his word? If you can't even hold faith that someone who has done all of these things, God would not forsake them. You can't even look at someone else's experience and do that because I don't, I don't see any of the people who were here before. How will you do it? How will you walk in that yourself? Part of what God's been building in me, this is actually a, a, a really wonderful time right now because there are times when God is bringing you, you know, read this over and over and over and over in scripture. He's bringing you through scripture, speaking these different messages to you. And, and, and like, you know, I'll tell you from personal experience, especially when he's been doing this over a period of years. So I can only imag imagine poor Jeremiah, who was prophesying for 23 years and couldn't have possibly known. I mean, all he was doing was saying, you guys need to repent or this land's going to be taken from you. He had no idea the way God was going to do that. Just like I have no idea the way that he's going to do something. So I can only go with what he tells me along the way, what he reveals to me along the way. And then he brings together scripture for that second witness, his spirit and his word. That's where we're supposed to be worshiping. That's what John 4 says, his spirit and his truth. So he brings in that second witness to show me the things I've been saying to you are true. Well, he's been doing that with me regarding sword, famine, wild beast, and plague for two and a half years. I can understand in hindsight, I can, I can see this because this is the last year that I'm here before the Antichrist rises. And so it makes sense that two and a half years ago, he would have had me start talking about a message of what is going to culminate before I die. Sword, famine, wild beast, and plague. And I've been speaking to you about this in these various videos on Arab nations and Israel in, you know, the, the, the videos subsequent to that where he continues to talk with me. And I've been telling you what he tells me. And now he's shown me where that is in scripture and why it is that this has to happen at this time in history before the Antichrist rises. So the reason I say that this is a very happy time or a good time is because, not because the message is, good, is necessarily happy, believe me, it's not going to be a good time, but because he's now bringing together the picture. So there's been a lot of labor that has gone into receiving this message and having it built in me. And I have been sharing it with you as he's been sharing it with me. You're my witness. If you listen to this channel, you're my witness of the process that God has taken me through. That it's not this easy process of him, you know, showing me a vision or something like that. Now, oh, now I understand everything. And I don't actually think that it was that way for the prophets either, for the prophets of old. But you have to kind of understand the way that God is working with his prophets now at this point in history, his witnesses, versus the way that he worked with his prophets of old. It's not entirely different, but the part that is different is that now we're at the fulfillment. And so reasonably being at the fulfillment, now God is pointing backward and he's saying, okay, now these things that the prophet spoke, this is how this is unfolding. That's what I'm trying to get you to understand. People who say that there are no, no more prophets do not know the word, by the way. Jesus said, I'm going to send you more prophets and sages and you're going to kill them too. He already said that. The book of Revelation talks about in Revelation 7, how these two prophets had tormented those who lived on the earth in Revelation. I'm sorry, that wasn't a Re Revelation 7, it's Revelation 11:10. So for people to say that there are no prophets, 
uh, that God doesn't speak to us in the same way. They don't know what they're talking about. And the reason they don't know what they're talking about is because they don't hear from God because they're not from him. And yet these are the very people who exalt themselves and venerate themselves and, and take their own glory here. Like, why? Why are they speaking at all if they don't hear from God? That's scary. Didn't God give us his Holy Spirit for a reason? As the counselor, I want to share with you what God is sharing with me, specifically regarding the great delusion. So we're going to start in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, reading about this great delusion. Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers and sisters, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by the teaching allegedly from us, whether by a prophecy or by word of mouth or by letter, asserting that the day of the Lord has already come. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed. Listen, the man of lawlessness is Satan. The Antichrist is not a man. The rest of the word interprets who the Antichrist is. It is a kingdom. It is the kingdom of Satan, all those who love falsehood. The man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. Also, no temple is going to be built that God acknowledges as his temple. God does not dwell in temples made by human hands, and he's not going backward. He's going forward. The New Testament tells us we are his temple. So where Satan sets himself up is in God's church and in these individual members of God's church. That's the mark of the beast. If Satan is what is occupying someone, if the seal of God is represented as the, by the presence of God, then the mark of the beast is represented by the presence of the beast. It's not that complicated. It's unstable people in counterfeit Christianity with all their superstitions and their witchcraft and their weird interpretations of what the word means so that they're actually shouting Shanda Boko Bobo and they think that they're saying something. I mean, this is unstable, guys. Jews in Israel think that Christianity, which really what they're looking at is counterfeit Christianity, they think that that is unstable. I think it's unstable too. I think it's ridiculous and an embarrassment to God's house. The ways that these people interpret God's word. It's embarrassing. So the resurrection is not going to happen until this happens. He sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. That is the mark of the beast. Because you're going to be identified by who you belong to. You've been created as a vessel, so whoever's occupying you is who you belong to. And whoever's occupying you becomes your character, becomes the way that you think, the way that you believe, and the way that you behave. That is represented in your forehead, the way you think and believe, as coming from your heart. And what is represented in your right hand is the way that you behave by what's coming from your heart. These things are not a mystery. They're not some great mystery. It's people who, have, who are unstable, don't know the word of God, don't have the spirit of God, but are setting themselves up for their own glory. They mislead you. And if they mislead you, it's because you don't love truth. So anyone that you're listening to, you need to go back and make sure that you discern that person and the information coming from their lips with God. You don't set these people up as idols. If a stranger came up to you on the street and was like, I have this glass of wine. Here, drink this glass of wine. Here, drink it, drink it. Wouldn't you be sus like suspicious of that? Or are you just going to drink from any stranger? That's what you're doing when you go to people on YouTube and you just listen to what they say and you ingest it and accept it at face value. That's what you're doing when you step into a church and you go and you listen to some pastor. You don't know how he lives. You don't know anything about him. I tell you how I live. I tell you the things that I'm going through so that you know the, the fruit of one who is actually in God. And you can go back to him and you can ask him to testify. And he will. He does. I know he testifies because I know that I'm his handiwork. I know that I have sat in his, in his counsel and that the things that I speak to you have come from what he has built in me. And what the word says is that that wine, that doctrine that people in counterfeit Christianity are drunk on it. They are overcome by it so that they're in delusion and they're covered in vomit. Don't you remember that I, when I was with you, I used to tell you these things and now you know what is holding him back so that he may be revealed at the proper time. Let's review. Before the resurrection happens, the man of lawlessness will be revealed. 
He will oppose and exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. Are you going to see Satan in another person? Yes, you will. You'll see it by their right hand and their forehead. You will see it by the way that they speak, what they believe, and how they act. Do you think that people who call themselves chosen, who commit murder, sodomy, rape, steal people's land, is that the fruit of what? Is that the fruit of being chosen? And how about the people supporting them who go and sign their bombs, finish them? Is that the fruit of being chosen? Don't be stupid. Even pagans can see that. That is the way that Jesus discerned. When people were saying to him, we're Abraham's children, we're descended from Abraham. He said, I know that you are descended from Abraham. And yet, if you were his children, you would do what Abraham did. You're children of the devil. How did Jesus discern? By descent? Did he see Satan in them? How did he know that they were children of the devil? Well, he answered his own question. He said that their desire is to do what the devil desires to do, which was to murder him. So those who support murder, which is against God's law, by the way, newsflash, what did Jesus say to Peter when Peter cut off the, the, the guard's ear? He said, those who live by the sword are going to die by the sword. Don't be doing that. And then he healed the guy's ear. Why would anyone go to war and call that Christian? Unless they're delusional. Unless they've been handed over to, for, to deception because they do not love truth. Unless they're going to their destruction, their condemnation. Paul says, don't let anyone deceive you in any way for the day will not come until the rebellion occurs. What rebellion? If the pagans? Oh, is that what Marjorie Taylor Greene says? Oh, somebody needs to repent. It's the pagans. It's the LGBTQ plus community, right? Newsflash, guys. This is God's people. That's who he's talking to. Until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or his worship so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. Oh my goodness. He sets himself up in God's people? Those called to be in God? So not the pagans? The word prophesies that those from foreign nations, pagan nations are going to be saved before many of those, many of those, most of those calling themselves God's people. Remember what Jesus said? Many are called, few are chosen. So when he talks about many and few, he's talking about most. Isn't that kind of defined by the context? Most. So if you're going to a mega church that everyone accepts the message of the counterfeit pastor preaching there, you're one of the many. You're one of the most who are going into the lake of burning sulfur because you have not loved truth. That's what you accept. That's where you hang out. That's what's on your forehead. And that's what's in your right hand. Don't you remember that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things, and now you know what is holding him back, so that he may be revealed at the proper time, for the secret power of lawlessness is already at work, but the one who now holds it back will continue to do so till he's taken out of the way. How is God taken out of the way? No one has the power or authority to take God out of the way, but because God is a respecter of choice, another way to understand this is until God takes himself out of the way because the people have chosen the devil. You understand what this is saying? He's been protecting you, but if you deny him, if you reject him, he'll take himself out of the way, and then you'll be handed over to the one you've chosen. You understand, guys? 1,071 of you who don't go to Sabbath, who have not made this a commitment, who think that I'm somehow a cult because I tell you, you need to return to God, you need to fast and return to him if you want to join us. That's your covenant. I'm just asking you to do what's in your covenant. And I'm asking you to do it for two reasons. One, because it's in your covenant. Two, we don't want anybody in the body. This is not inclusive. This is exclusive. We don't want anyone here who is going to distract from the message, who's going to refuse to be used for the kingdom of God. You want to go hide away in some congregation while a pastor up at a pulpit does all the work for you. Knock yourself out. We assemble the way that Paul told us to assemble. Each person is to bring something that comes from God, that comes from their, spiritually, their spiritual developmental stage with God, each person. And if you don't have anything to bring, it's because you haven't returned to him. Does the I say to the other I, I'm going to take the day off today? How would that work between your two legs? One decides, you know what, I, I'm going to take a nap. You need to finish out the walk. How, how would that work? Would you be able to walk? Not really. You'd be hopping down the street. The body needs to be in unison as brought together by God's spirit. If you don't have God's spirit, you don't belong in the body. If what you have is a spirit of fear, God has already told you that he's not giving you a spirit of fear. That's a different spirit. He's giving you a spirit of love, power, sound mind, and self-control. 
So if you actually return to him, he will cast out that spirit of fear and he will inhabit you. Do you think that we want someone in the body who's bringing that spirit, who's decided not to participate in their covenant, and we're just going to be like, oh, let them hang out long enough. They'll get it eventually. Is that what Jesus did? Jesus discerned by what he was seeing in the moment. He didn't say, well, you know, in a week you might, I don't know. Verse 8, and then the lawless one will be revealed, whom Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with how Satan works. He will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie. Now, in other translations, it says through false powers and signs, or false signs and wonders, excuse me, uh, that serve the lie, and that is the more correct interpretation. And all the ways that wickedness deceives those who are perishing. Let me read it again. The coming of the lost one will be in accordance with how Satan works. He will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie and all the ways that wickedness deceives those who are perishing. All the ways that wickedness deceives those who are perishing. Do you see what he's saying? They're going to believe his signs and wonders. All the ways that wickedness deceives those who are perishing. All their counterfeit doctrines, all the things that they believe. Oh, Jesus paid it all. Let's make up a song about it. We're just waiting here. We're just waiting real patiently. Oh my goodness, I'm suffering so much living my best life here while I wait for Jesus to just pick me up. No, God's wrath is not for us. Never mind the fact that God brings wrath on his people. Read Leviticus 26, read Deuteronomy 28, read Revelation for Pete's sake. God's great wrath is not for his people, but the people saying that are not his people. The people using that to live their best life here, they're not receiving the conviction of God. They're not being purified, made spotless and refined, or they would know that there's a difference between God's great wrath and the wrath he brings on you in judgment. They would know the rest of the word that says, don't be surprised about the fiery trial that's come on you. Judgment begins with God's house first. If you belong to the world, the world would love you as its own. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with how Satan works. He will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie and all the ways that wickedness deceives those who are perishing. They perish because... They refuse to love the truth and so be saved. In Hosea, it says, because you rejected the truth, I reject you as my priests. These are not God's people. This is the Antichrist kingdom of counterfeit Christianity. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie and so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth but have delighted in wickedness. Now, I want to tell you something. I posted a, a documentary that's a very good documentary, but I did a commentary on it entitled Hastening Armageddon, and I strongly encourage you to listen to it. There are four videos, parts one through four, Hastening Armageddon. In that video, I demonstrate to you the narrative that is being played out in counterfeit Christianity that Donald Trump, who just is our president-elect, was just elected to be the next president in January, just in time for the Antichrist power kingdom to rise, overpower, and kill the witnesses next year. That documentary is going to show you the doctrines and the key players who are pastoring the Donald Trump administration. They were pastoring him when he was president before of the United States. And why am I focused on the United States? Is it because I live here? No, because it's the false prophet. They were pastoring him then. They've been pastoring him. They will pastor him again. These are the doctrines the new apostolic reformation, the seven mountains mandate. You need to know what's going to be leading things. Not necessarily the people, but the spirits, the ideologies, the mark of the beast that's going to pastor this nation and much of the world. At this point in history, you should be able to know this and see it. Now, I think that the documentary is an excellent documentary. The only problem is they don't explain things from a biblical perspective. They explain things as pagans, which is actually, at this point in history, a lot more refreshing and true than counterfeit Christianity. The problem is, it, it is not biblical. The one thing that these pagans are able to do is point out that this is completely bananas, that counterfeit Christianity is totally delusional. I mean, when you watch that documentary, if you watch it, you're going to see how filthy and disgusting and embarrassing and delusional and ill, spiritually ill, these people are the way that they are interpreting things. It is so sick. But I do encourage you to listen to the part one through four before you watch it because it's going to help you to be able to see the times, to understand how this is fitting into biblical prophecy and the things that I've been telling you for the last two and a half years. I want to talk about this delusion. The delusions 
of counterfeit Christianity include all the ways that wickedness deceives those who are perishing. They've chosen the deception. You don't feel bad for them. They chose this. And they perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Do you see the choice in there? For this reason, because of this, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie and so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth but have delighted in wickedness. Now you know the reason why he sends it. Let's talk about what it is. So much of the fulfillment of the great delusion hinges on the counterfeit Christian definition of what Israel even is. Israel are those, were those originally who were descended from Israel, from Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel. Did they have a land? No, they didn't. They didn't have anything. They were slaves in Egypt because Abraham was told that his descendants were going to be slaves in Egypt for 400 years. They were brought into a land, and before they were brought in there, Moses told them, you're going to go prostitute yourselves to the idols and the false gods of this land, and God's going to drive you from the land. And he taught them a song so that they would actually remember the prophecy that he told them because Moses was going on the mountain to die. When the Bible refers to the land of Israel, it's kind of like when you say Carrie's home. Oh, that's Carrie's home there. That's Carrie's land. That's the land of Carrie. You get the picture? You don't name the land Carrie. My home is not named Carrie. The people are named Israel. So God set apart this nation, Israel, to be set apart from all other nations, to be a nation holy to him. And there was a Messiah who was promised. And when that Messiah came, he extended salvation to the Gentiles. So no longer was there a physical nation that was set apart from other nations. Now you were to understand that the spiritual nation of Israel, as Paul explained, is not all descended from Israel. Not all who are descended from Israel are Israel. Not all who are descended from Abraham are Abraham's children. And in fact, Jesus already told you that. He told you that in John. In John 7 and 8, he's rebuking this group of Jews and he's telling them, I know you're descended from Abraham, but if you were his children, you'd do what he did. You're children of the devil because you're looking for a way to kill me. And your father, the devil, was a murderer from the beginning. You want to do the things he did? Then that's your father. That's who owns you. That's your master. You are slaves. Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. There is no land called Israel. The land, by the way, that the Israelites were brought into, Canaan, Ai, Jericho. Did they change the name of the land? No. In Acts 1, when the apostles said to Jesus, are you now going to restore the kingdom to Israel? What were they asking? You're going to restore the kingdom to the land? No, that's not what they were asking. Even when the kingdom was split apart, the northern part of the kingdom, the people who fled to the north were called Israel. The southern kingdom was called Judah. This is always referred to a people. God established a physical nation to help you understand a spiritual nation that is scattered through the entire world, guys. No lost tribes of Israel. Give me a break. Stop with that doctrine. When God referred to the lost sheep, he was referring to those who were spiritually lost. There are no lost tribes of Israel. God knows every single one who are his. So enough of that. All your conspiracy theories and superstitions, stop it. It's stupidity. That is a love for falsehood. Israel are God's people. Paul defined a Jew to be one who is not, not circumcised externally. He said circumcision externally is nothing, but one who is circumcised in heart from the sinful flesh. You want to be in the covenant, that's who you have to be. That is what defines a Jew. Paul talked about a natural olive tree and a wild olive tree that was engrafted into the natural olive tree, and some of the natural branches were cut off. Representing what? Representing Israel. Does that make Israel a tree? Shall we go plant a tree and call it Israel? No. Israel are God's people. They include ethnic Jews, ethnic Japanese, ethnic Mexicans, okay? Let's not be ridiculous. Gentiles and Jews. Gentiles who are circumcised in heart have been engrafted into the natural olive tree, meaning that they have been engrafted into the commonwealth of Israel, the nation. Now, the scripture being used by counterfeit Christianity is this. Luke 21, verse 20. When you see Jerusalem being surrounded by armies, you will know that its desolation is near. And they have this counterfeit doctrine that when that happens, they're coming to fight the battle of Armageddon. Let me tell you what the word actually says. It says, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those in the city get out. Let those in the country not enter the city. For this is the time of punishment in fulfillment of all that has been written. 
how dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. And what is the time of punishment of all that has been written? That's when God's great wrath begins. And guess what? God's people are going to be here. The Bible states it. And they're going to be killed during that time, not by God, but by the Antichrist. The Antichrist will not be reigning anymore because God has risen from his dwelling because the abomination of desolation has incited his jealous wrath. But God's people are going to be here for four, for 45 days of God's great wrath. From the 1290th day to the 1335th day, as spoken of by Daniel in Daniel 12. This is the time of which it says in Revelation that the multitude in white robes came out of the great tribulation. So what are people talking about with regard to a pre-tribulation rapture? Why would it say that the multitude in white robes came out of the great tribulation? The time of great distress that Jesus is talking about right here. Makes no sense. And yet the battle of Armageddon has not happened yet. Here's how things go in the book of Revelation. At the beginning of the seven-year period, the witnesses begin to testify. They testify until the 1260th day. Then the Antichrist rises from the abyss to overpower and kill the witnesses, and he goes after God's people, Revelation 12. He has lost his place in the heavenly realms. In Revelation 9, you see him as a star. He falls from the sky. He, goes into, he has the key to the shaft of the abyss. He rises from the abyss, and the Antichrist reign begins. So does the first woe. Why does the first woe begin? Because they've killed God's prophets. When that beast rises from the abyss, he is going to overpower and kill the witnesses. And then he goes after God's church, as is depicted in Revelation 12. For 42 months, the Antichrist reigns. From the time that the witnesses are thrown down, the daily sacrifice and the sanctuary, both representing the witnesses, there will be 1,290 days. This is in Daniel 12. There will be 1,290 days until the abomination of desolation is set up. The Antichrist kingdom will have been reigning during that time. This is what Revelation speaks of when John is told to go and measure the temple, but not the outer court because it's been given to the Gentiles to trample on. You see that he's not referring to this counterfeit Christian kingdom of the Antichrist. He doesn't refer to them as Jews. He refers to them as Gentiles. But they're calling themselves chosen. On the 1290th day, the abomination of desolation will be set up. This begins that period of, that is dreadful. The time of distress such as has not happened since the beginning of the world until then says so in Matthew 24. I'm telling you the, the, the citations, I'm using the language of the Bible, that way you can look it up for yourself. Blessed is the one who reaches the 1335th day. What's going to be going on during that time? God's great wrath has begun because his jealous wrath has been incited by the abomination of desolation. Also, not something you're going to see. Also, something that is in your heart. In Ezekiel 8, you're told that you're going to see the abomination of desolation by the end of Ezekiel being walked through the temple, and you do. The women are mourning God, the god Tammuz. The men are bowing down to the sun in the east. Guess what the image of Tammuz is? It's the cross. You know, the cross, the image you were never supposed to set up, that people bow down and kiss and worship. God told you ahead of time, don't bow down, don't make yourself an image, don't bow down, don't kiss it. That's what your mother of the Harlot Catholic Church does, if that's what you're doing. That's what the prostitutes that wore out of her, Revelation 17, 5, that's what they do. All of the world thinks that this, you know, that this image is a symbol of Christianity. No, it's not. Because you were told not to have an image. That will have been embedded in your heart. That's why God's jealous wrath is incited by that time. That's why Paul spoke in the way that he did in 2 Thessalonians. When he said, don't let anyone deceive you in any way. For that day will not come until the rebellion occurs. And the man of lawlessness is revealed. The man doomed to his destruction. The rebellion occurs. People don't care about truth anymore. Blessed is the one who reaches 1,335 days. So in those days... The sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, a great earthquake happens, the heavens recede like a scroll, the stars drop like figs from the sky. And in those days, when the seventh trumpet is about to sound, the mystery of God is accomplished in the resurrection. And then when the trumpet sounds, the bowls of wrath begin to be poured out on the wicked who remain. When those bowls of wrath are done, this is throughout the book of Revelation, guys, when the bowls of wrath were completed, Babylon falls. Though the rest of people are allowed to uh, live for a little while. You ever watch someone get a, get a beating and know that you were next? It's terrifying. That's being described in Revelation. The kings of the earth stand far off. Whoa, whoa, whoa to you, Babylon. Do you think they care about Babylon? They hate her. They stripped her naked. They burned her flesh. But they're horrified because they know they're next. So they gather for the battle of Armageddon. Wait, wait, wait. Has the resurrection happened already? Yes, it has. After Babylon falls... The wedding supper of the lamb comes, which means Jesus marries his bride. So while all these dum-dums here are, 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 are gathering for the battle of Armageddon, 
Jesus is marrying his bride. And then he returns with his bride behind him. How do we know that? Because it says that the bride is dressed in fine linen, white and clean, which stands for the righteous acts of God. And then when he returns, it says that his, the armies of heaven following him are in fine linen, white and clean. Literally, next paragraph. Someone was arguing with me about whether these were angels. They don't know what they're talking about. They're not reading the same word I'm reading. This is God's bride. These are his priests. These are the sons of God. They're following behind him as he comes for the battle of Armageddon. Are they dressed in camouflage? Are they, uh, do they have swords in their hand? Are they ready for a battle? No, not really. And the way that Jesus fights this battle is by the double-edged sword coming out of his mouth. Do you think that Jesus is just ridiculous? He's going to whip his head back and forth and, and, and just slay everyone by that sword coming out of his mouth? No. The word is sharper than a two-edged sword. They're going to be going through a lot worse torment than a physical torment that they could ever experience. And they're not, going to, they're not going to get off that easy to where they just experience physical death and then they go and, you know, return to the dust or something. What did Paul say? He's going to slay the enemy by the breath of his mouth, Jesus. He's going to slay the enemy by the breath of his mouth. When he returns for the battle of Armageddon, the false prophet and the Antichrist of counterfeit Christianity, this false kingdom, are being thrown into the lake of burning sulfur. So I want to tell you right now, if you continue to go to some counterfeit church or hang out in some counterfeit study or whatever where people are teaching things that aren't true, you discern the things I say, you listen to my videos and stuff like that. But I've known these people for 20 years. I want to go and hang out with them. They're a lot more fun than you, carry. I guarantee you they're a lot more fun than me. I am not fun. My life is not fun. My life stinks because of the things that I'm required to say and, and required to do. I guarantee you they're a lot more fun than me. But I'm not here to be fun. And I'm not here to be friends with, you know, to make friends. I'm here to fulfill my covenant. So if that's your attitude, I know where you're going. If it's that easy for you to hear the message that I'm speaking, that counterfeit Christianity, the kingdom of the Antichrist, is going to be thrown into Lake of Burning Silver. You hear that message and you're like, but I've known them for 20 years, Carrie. I know where you're going. I know what's in your heart. That's called discernment. And that is a form of judgment. It's not the form of judgment that God told us not to do, or he wouldn't have done it. And he wouldn't have taught us to discern. He wouldn't have told us, discern the fruit and test the spirit. When he says not to judge, that's a different kind of judgment. That's the order of things. Now let me tell you what counterfeit Christianity believes. What they believe is that they're raising a militia right now at this point in history. And this is the way that Donald Trump's administration is being pastored by false teachers like John Hagee, Robert Jeffress, and... Ralph Drong Drawlinger. What these people believe in is the new apostolic reformation. What is that? The word talk about that? No. Why did, why do they feel the need to keep adding these concepts in this language that is not written in the Bible? If they read the Bible, they would know that the Bible says don't add to the scroll. Why are they doing that? New apostolic reformation of which part of their doctrine is the seven mountains mandate where they need to influence people into being Christian. That's not what Jesus did. He wasn't like, oh, well, let's make sure that we put this in social media and let's market ourselves this way. <laughs> what is all this? Seven Mountains Mandate is a way of essentially like controlling the information that gets to you. And then saying anybody who does not believe in this information is going to be killed. So what they believe is that they're going to fight this battle of Armageddon, that there's going to be this massive world war between Iran Iraq, Russia, Israel, the United States, that they're all going to this, they're going into this world war and get this, that their goal is to kill anyone who does not believe the way that they do, religiously or politically, because they equate politics and religion to be the same thing. When they joined church and state in this antichrist, there's no difference between politics and religion. Uh, do you see that at the door? Hello? Is that your Christianity? Because it's not mine. More importantly, is that Jesus Christianity? We were never supposed to even want a human king. God is the one who appoints the spirit that's going to rule over us, dependent on our obedience, not our vote. What is all of this that we prostituted ourselves to? So how are they interpreting this? Well, let's go back to that Luke context in Luke 21, when Jesus says, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, guess what? Jerusalem in Revelation is said to be a bride beautifully dressed for her husband coming out of the sky. Hmm, sounds like he's talking about his people, not a land. When you see Jerusalem being surrounded by armies, you know that its desolation is near. 
Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those in the city get out. Let those in the country not enter the city. For this is the time of punishment in fulfillment of all that has been written. Let's compare what he just said with what we find in Matthew 24. Verse 15. So when you see standing in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the housetop go down to get anything out of the house. Let no one in the field go back to get their cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that your flight will not take place in winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be great distress unequaled from the beginning of the world until now and never to be equaled again. What's the timing of this? Is that the battle of Armageddon? No, that's when the abomination of desolation is seen. So we know that that's the period from the 1290th day to the 1335th day of which God rises from his dwelling because his jealous wrath has been incited and his great wrath begins. This is when Jesus is being revealed. It's also when the man of lawlessness is being revealed. God's been taken out of the way. How's he been taken out of the way? Because what has been established in their heart? The abomination of desolation. And now during this time, God is bringing his great wrath on the wicked. And yes, his great wrath does pass over those who have the seal of God. Did he have to pre-trib rapture them up? No. And he didn't have to do that during the first Passover either. The Israelites were still here. And yet God took the firstborn of every livestock and a uh, human being in the house of the Egyptians. He was able to pass over the Israelites. Imagine that. Oh my goodness. Is God limited, guys? He can't give COVID to one person and spare the other. These people put limitations on God. On, on God. They, they don't even understand what they're doing. They have the appearance of godliness, but they deny his power. You see what they say? Oh, well, his wrath is here. So they, they had to, must have been pre-trib raptured up. Whatever rapture is, not even a word in the Bible. The Bible wasn't written in, in uh, Latin. So we know when this is happening. Now, counterfeit Christianity is taking this context. When you see the nation surrounding Jerusalem, they are translating that into what's going on right now. And what is going to go on when the king of Assyria is used as the razor to shave Jerusalem. Let me say it again, because I've been telling you about this. I've been telling you that this is what God is telling me is going to happen. I did an entire series on Arab nations in Israel. I have been telling you that Assyria is going to be hired from beyond the Euphrates as a razor to shave Jerusalem down into a remnant. I have been telling you that this is going to come before Babylon rises in order to bring, bring people low enough to come in and also to separate the wheat from the tares in one final shaving process. How are they shaved? In Isaiah, you see that they are shaved. The fruit of them having been shaved off of the remnant, expelled from the land, is that they are hardened. What is the land? The spiritual land that they were brought into by Christ when he revealed himself to, him, to them, they've been expelled. They prostituted themselves to these counterfeit churches and their doctrines. Now they're being handed over to that. That's what they chose. He did not bring you into the land to go prostitute yourselves to what you want to do. None of the early Christians thought that way. None of that was introduced until the Harlot Catholic Church came in. Babylon the Great and continues in the prostitutes that bore out of her and continues in the image of the Antichrist that they worship, that they give blank check support to, that no one can speak anything about for fear of being persecuted, jailed, or killed. I'm not afraid of any of that. I know what I've been set apart to do. I know that God is the one in control of whatever happens to me. And I have known from the very beginning that I was going to die for what I'm doing. I'm going to leave the video here. There's more that I would like to tell you. There's more that I would like to reveal regarding this, but I'm going to put it in a part two because I know people need to go to God. You need to go discern this with him. And I want to give you an opportunity to just sort of chew on this and digest what we're talking about and what is going to be happening, how it's going to fit into that counterfeit Christian narrative. In the next video, I'm going to show you where these things are in scripture. I'm going to talk with you a little bit more about how this is going to go down at least from the perspective of what God is showing me. I don't know everything. None of this comes from me. No one should think that there's anything special about me that I have special knowledge. The only thing that I do have is that I am submitted to God and he does tell me these things. He does show me in scripture and he lets me know when they're being revealed. Please discern this message from God and I'll see you in the next video.